The great thing about LED lighting is it's so reliable. Um, right, okay, let's uh, see what's happening here then, shall we? So here's the culprit for that flashing, and I have to say it was very annoying. Uh, my apologies for the strobing there, that's just what happens with LED power supplies when certain faults develop. In this case, uh, the first suspect was the bootstrap circuit in this, and uh, the first thing I did was I actually removed the bootstrap capacitor, I checked other capacitors for the value. Now that's not an accurate way to test electrolytics though, um, you really should test them for what's called their ESR, equivalent series resistance, because as these capacitors bake and dry out, they tend to go quite high in the resistance value. Uh, but uh, it, it looks in good condition, it's not bulging or anything like that, it's, uh, it's not an old enough unit for that to really be a significant problem, although I suppose there is no time limit really on uh, some of the shittier capacitors. However, uh, this, uh, the first thing I did was uh, I removed the little uh, power supply capacitor for the switch mode power supply chip. And I put, uh, put a new one in, but uh, just kept its leads real long. I uh, hooked it up to the mains again, and the lights, and I put a meter across that to see what's happening. And it was like, uh, obvious it's going to be quite unstable because uh, the p power was pulsing on and off. I should really explain this a bit better. I'm going to get the notepad here and describe the little bootstrap circuit used for switch mode power supplies. Okay, so switch mode power supply. Here's the mains come in, mains in. In our case, 240 volts, supposedly 230 volts, but uh, still 240 volts. And that comes in and goes straight into a bridge rectifier. It doesn't really actually go straight into a bridge rectifier. It goes through various filters. This one has the full bridge rectifier based on discrete diodes, but it's got a fuse. Uh, interference suppression capacitor across the mains and uh, after the fuse and a little inductor to try and sort of suppress noise. So that, that's all good stuff. It's all it's a little strange little capacitor there that I'm not quite... Oh right, it's part of the, it's part of the switch mode circuitry, that's okay. So uh, AC in plus and minus out. It's converted through a bridge far to DC. So let's take that up and put a rail up there and a rail down here. And that one is the plus... 330 volt in our case because it's the peak mains voltage and this is zero volt although not zero volt in the sense that if you touched it you wouldn't get a shock you'd get a horrible shock if you touched it because it is reference to the mains but zero volts uh, in reference in this circuit it's a sort of base voltage so um, we've got a smoothing capacitor across here in this case it's uh, this one here and it's 10 microfarad 400 volts And that's the main smoothing capacitor for the whole circuit. That that means that the choppy incoming uh, AC that converts to DC gets then smoothed out. So it, there's the uh, something level that the switch mode power supply chip, this little chip here, can actually work with. So let's uh, draw the chip and let's just call it control chip because there's so many of them. And uh, a lot of them share similar numbers, a lot of them are clones. So uh, let's just say control chip and it's this switch mode control chip. Now these sometimes switch the transformer with a transistor or sometimes they switch it directly. This one is switching it directly with a transistor built into the chip. So here is the primary of that transformer. Let's call it primary. And it's going to the chip and getting switched to the chip to the sort of ground rail, the zero volt rail, which is an actual mains ground. And the primary, the secondary of that, uh, the main other winding in this, then goes out uh, through a diode that's uh, this big fat diode here and charges these two capacitors in parallel. Sometimes they add a little bit more filtering, they haven't done this instance. And this is uh, just showing the basic output uh, of it, so that would be plus and minus, but there is actually a bit more circuitry. There's a little voltage threshold detector in here programmed to set the exact 12, 12 volts out with the, a couple of a high act high accuracy resistors, and it drives that up twice later. There's also a little uh, class Y capacitor for interference suppression uh, purposes as well. <coughs> However, the important bit, the bit we're really looking at here, is this little uh, capacitor here, because this capacitor provides the power supply to the control chip, and the control chip needs power to actually operate. So initially it gets its power via a resistor uh, from the a th high 330 volt rail, and that's not an efficient way of providing power. You couldn't just provide the 
this, this could require several milliamps, and if you tried to do that via a resistor, it would be quite a high value, but uh, quite a low value, and it would get very, very hot. So this is normally the region of one megaohm. I've not actually checked the value of this one. Uh, what it, let's find out what value it is. It's usually one or two megaohms. So there's the capacitor. That looks like the resistor there that's doing it. So uh, that value of that one is brown, black, green, one megaohm. It's textbook, it is one megaohm. So um, that, initially when you turn the power supply on, there's a slight delay. The lights don't light up instantly. There's a wee pause and then, uh, and the pause is caused by this capacitor charging up to a voltage threshold that this chip will kick in. So it gradually creeps up uh, with trickle charging through this resistor here until it reaches that control threshold and then the chip will start. And when it starts, it then powers itself from an another winding. And let's call it the bootstrap winding. And that uh, just, it's a, a small extra winding just for powering that chip. And it, it has the winding, a diode. In this case, it's this diode here coming from the transformer and keeping that capacitor topped up. And as soon as the system's running, this resistor will still probably be trickling current. It won't stop doing that, but it's, it's a very small amount. But the main power will be supplied through this, from the winding, through the diode, and that will just keep the control chip happy. So I did change that capacitor, uh, and it uh, didn't fix the problem, and I measured the voltage across. It was spiking up. So then I looked for the next things. And the next thing I'd look under these circumstances uh, if I didn't think this main capacitor was faulty, is this bit of circuitry here, which is the bootstrap circuit. And it had a very crusty, dry-looking joint on the diode. So I touched all the joints on that with a, a flux pen. Flux pen. Uh, I did a wee touch of solder uh, and re them all. And that has fixed the problem. So it could have been uh, that the... It could either have been the connection onto the circuit board from the transformer, or it could have been the connection from the winding onto the pin from the transformer, and simply the reflowing of the soda down here has actually reflowed that so that solder on the pin as well. So this is now fixed, and that uh, resolved the problem. But uh, I just thought it was a, a useful, you know, I, it was a good idea to make a video showing how this little bootstrap circuit works here, and. Uh, why a lot of these power supplies tend to start flicking and flashing when they get to the sort of end of life or, or just when they develop a fault. Uh-oh, it's back on the bench because I thought I'd fixed it, I thought I'd solved the problem and it worked fine for a couple of nights and then the problem came back again. And I thought, okay, that's quite interesting. Let's see if we can narrow this down further. It may just be that uh, my disturbing it so fixed it temporarily. So I was checking all the solder joints and reflowed a few of them. And I thought, what's the next culprit going to be? It could be the main smoothing capacitor is actually drying out and it's causing a lot of ripple because that's what happens. The, when these dry out, these capacitors, their internal resistance goes up and it means that they can't smooth the, the AC into DC, the, uh, should I say, the, the rectified DC, it can't uh, smooth it uh, as well as it should and it results in ripple that can cause circuitry to reset. <clears throat> so uh, I decided let's rule that out. If it's on the borderline, let's get another 400 volt capacitor and just tack it across the back. Uh, this is a 10 megafarad capacitor, this is a 4.71. All I did was just add another in parallel across the back just to boost the capacitance up, just to lift it back above that threshold. And that didn't fix the problem, which it was uh, surprising at that point. Then I thought, maybe the output's got ripple and it's unstable, but you know, uh, it's not an old power supply, and it's, um, you know, it's not heavily loaded, but I thought, there's no harm, I'll get a 1000 megafarad capacitor, I'll tack it across the output, across these ones, and see if that helps. No, it didn't. So I'm thinking, well, you know, it really does look like the, uh, the bootstrap circuit, the one that provides power to the chip, so I'll desolder the transformer and I'll take a look, just in case there's uh, bad connections on it. And here's an interesting thing about this transformer. The output side here, is just the tails, the actual secondary windings. It's not got pins in it. Uh, it's the there are pins in the two windings in the primary, but um, the on the secondary side it is actually just the windings themselves. And the transformer comes straight out, poke through the uh, quite large holes in the circuit board and solder. Just they're bent over and soldered. That's why it looks a bit messy in the output side. 
Uh, so I took the transformer out, a wee bit footery, got it out, uh, re-soldered all those connections, uh, and p- particularly the ones that do the bootstrap circuit, and uh, then I re-soldered it back in, and that didn't fix it. So then I thought, OK, next suspicious components, because I, I can check resistors and things like that, they're easy, they can do the, test those in, in situ. Next suspicious components are the capacitors, and there, there's a couple on here that I... I just desoldered them, and uh, they're the type of capacitors that uh, if you, um, like this is a, a small ceramic capacitor, that one's a mylar film capacitor. These ones tend to be able to be tested, unlike the electrolytics, which can show the, this correct value of capacitance, but actually have a high internal resistance. These ones tend to be, you know, a go or no go sort of situation. So uh, the worst thing that can happen with ceramic capacitors is they get wet, but that's not happened in this case. Uh, if what moisture gets into them, it can cause problems. But um, I took those capacitors out and measured them, and they were fine. So I'm thinking, that could mean it's the chip. Um, I don't think it's the feedback circuit. Uh, it could be the chip that's faulty. But I thought, one last thing, you know, it's very unlikely. I keep thinking it's the bootstrap circuit. What about the diode? So I took the diode, the bootstrap diode out, and this is an FR107 diode, and that's a fast recovery time diode. And the, the reason for that is that uh, if you can't use something like a 1N4004, a, an ordinary common diode in a situation like this, because these transformers are operating at very high frequency. And whereas these ones here can be just ordinary low frequency diodes because they're just dealing with mains voltage, this one has to be high frequency. So I thought, what can I change it for? And the only thing that came to mind was a 1N4148, because it's it's the only sort of fairly high speed diode I had that came to hand. So I put that in and boom, the problem has been solved. It was an intermittent problem with this diode failing. And when I'd been heating it up with the soldering, uh, that must have just uh, caused it to recover temporarily. But um, it looks like it's basically a going open circuit after it's heated up, um, though it doesn't really get that hot in, in normal use. So uh, the 1N4148 diode has fixed the problem finally. And, you know, it took a while and uh, it, it was interesting. I, I was just trying to guess what might actually be the problem with this. And it's this is the last component I suspected. And uh, that's the one that seems to have finally solved the problem by being replaced with just a standard small uh, high-speed diode. So, um, yeah, that was, an, that was an interesting uh, project, a little... Uh, sort of puzzle to solve.